God's promises are forever. His promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I didn't get a single amen, but let me say that again. God's promises are forever. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because his promises are the same, and because his words are yea and amen, it is important that we keep his promises in our heart. Because no one else's promises are forever. Even you may have been married 60 years, but one of these days one of you is going to go on and that promise won't be forever. But because God is eternal, his promises are forever. So if you call on him today, he'll answer. If you open his heart, he'll enter. If you will become his child, he will be your God. And if you will love him, he will be your best friend. So I made up my mind today that I'm going to come to him. I'm going to abide with him. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to talk with him. I am going to allow him to direct my path. I am always going to be his friend. I don't ever want to be separated from him. He will always be my savior. Everybody say forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his promises are forever, and they will never just pass away. In humanity, there is a vast difference between performance and intention. We all have great intentions. As a matter of fact, we use language that doesn't even really mean what it says. Children, Seth, you do that again, and I'm going to break your leg. I had no intention of breaking his leg, but I want him to know he's in trouble. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. And I heard, I've heard my wife say this a lot. You better stop that, or I'm coming in there. And she just, she just a big wimp when it comes to punishment. But and and we have intentions that never become reality. I, I'm going to be there. But we're not always there. We intended to be there. And when we say I'm going to be there, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that no matter what we're going to be there because we can't swear. Only God can swear. If you swear, you're just lying because you can't swear. Only God can swear by heaven and earth. Only God can say, if I say it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You can say, hey, I, come over to our house Friday night at 7. Let's have dinner. You say, I'll be there. And what you mean is I, my intentions are that I'm going to be there. But God never has intentions. Come on, somebody. When God says, I'll be there. When he says, I'm a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, he is there. Numbers chapter 23 and verse number 19, and we're going to move so fast. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and he will not do. Has he said, and he will not do. Or has he spoken, and will not make it good. Verse number, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. When God says something, it's so. We're going to read a lot of scriptures here in the next few minutes, just scripture after scripture after scripture. There's going to be something read here in the next few minutes that's directly from the Word of God, directly meant from God. It's a letter addressed in your name from the throne of heaven. God's writing you a letter written in his own blood. And as we read these scriptures, I want you to receive this blood letter with your address on it today. Before we begin to read these scriptures, let me tell you one thing. God cannot lie. Before I give you these scriptures, I'm going to prove that he cannot lie. That once he makes a promise, it is going to come to pass. As a matter of fact, if you look at the word shall in the New Testament, or even in the Old Testament, it goes back to the original word, and what it really means is it will be. When God says shall, it is going to happen. It will be. God cannot lie. When God says something, 
it is so. When God says, I intend to be there, he will be there. So you lay hold of the promises of God. Well, I don't know if I believe the promises of God or not. Well, let's talk about it. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before the promise was fulfilled, God said, I'm going to give a virgin a baby boy, and they're going to call his name Emmanuel. In Luke chapter 1, verse number 35, and the angel answered and said to her, 700 years later, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to born, be born will be called the Son of God. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 22 and verse number 23. So all this was done. So that God would keep his promise. So that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Somebody say amen this morning. When God says it's going to happen, when God says it will be, it will be. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7, ask. Everybody say ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you whom if his son asks for a bread, will he give him a stone? Listen to this. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, Ukraine, stock market. I don't know about all that. But I do know whose government. Listen to Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born. You listening for your word from the Lord today? Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government. I'm not too worried about what's going on. Because of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will. I mean, you really believe that's going to happen? Man. Matthew chapter 16, not too worried. And I will also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Somebody say amen. I'm not too worried about what's going on because God's in control. He said it's going to be, and it's going to be just like he said it's going to be. Listen to the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, chapter 18. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, He shall surely live. He shall not die. Everybody say, he shall not die. God called you. God birthed you into this world not to die, but he birthed you into this world. He birthed you into that second birth so that you could live forever. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Somebody lay hold of that today. You've done some terrible things, but God said if you'll turn from it, You're going to live, and not only live in this life, but you're going to live forever in eternity someday. The wicked should repent, and all of us have been wicked, so all of us need to repent. But he said, if the wicked would repent, how many of you would be so honest today as to wave your hand and say, I've been wicked a time or two? The Bible says if you'd repent, that it would not be mentioned again. God would never mention that again. Don't let somebody else bring something up to you that God's forgotten about. God said, hey, when I let it go, it's going to be done. It's gone. It's never coming back. But my feelings tell me I'm a failure. Some of you in here are running your life on how you feel. You tell your feelings to go on a vacation. You shall live and you shall not die. 
Come on, somebody, hang on to that today. Go to verse 27 of Ezekiel chapter 18 again. When a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he had committed, and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. I want to read a story quickly, and I've said everything I've said to get to where I'm, I'm at right now. Listen closely to the story of the man in the middle of the night. He said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me, everybody say three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, don't trouble me. The door is now shut. and My children are with me in bed. I, I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise, and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, because he just wouldn't quit, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Everybody say, not three, but as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find not and it will be opened unto you. When you are borrowing from a midnight friend, you just ask for the minimum. I know I'm troubling you, and I know it's the middle of the night, but the master has given us a principle of the kingdom here. If you can get the master of the house's attention, if you can somehow through your worship today get his attention, he's not going to give you three. He's not going to give you the minimum. He's going to give you everything you need. You can't ask him for the minimum. But once you have his attention, you can be guaranteed that God will give you everything that you need. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't settle. I don't want just crumbs from the master's table. And I don't just want his dogs to lick my sword. I want everything that the kingdom of God has to offer. Can I get a witness in the house? Praise God. Thank you for your attention. Luke 9. I didn't give you Luke 9. That's okay. For everyone who asks receives and who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Just a couple of scriptures we just read. 11.11, 11, if a son asks bread, or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Verse 13. Luke 11, verse 13, I'm sorry, 12, 13. If you bring evil, 13 is good, Seth, I'm sorry. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Everybody say the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need more than we need our next breath. We need the Holy Spirit. Because our next breath just keeps us alive temporarily on this earth, but the Holy Spirit keeps us alive forever in eternity. I need everybody say it. I need the Holy Spirit. I need it, I need it, I need it. David killed Goliath because of the promises of God. The giant was killed not with a sling and a stone, but the giant was killed with an I will that David really believed. David really believed that he was God's anointed. David really believed that he was God's man for the hour. David really believed that it was impossible for him to die because he had been anointed. David really believed that there's no way the giant could stand against the armies of his God. And he walked into that valley with that giant because he knew that God said, I'll do it, and he knew that God would do it. Listen to what Joshua said in the first chapter in the fifth and the sixth verses. No man, God's talking to Joshua, he said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. What a promise. Do you think Joshua went into battle with his chest poked out, feeling like 10 foot tall and bulletproof? Because God said, nobody is going to be able to stand in front of you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong. And if somebody receive it this morning, be strong and of good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Somebody say amen. So we measure 
too often, and I've just got a bunch of scriptures I'm going to read real fast and I'm going to be done, but we measure God's, I will, we measure God's promise by the size of the problem. If it had been a midget walk out into the valley, looking up, first one out of his tent would have been King Saul. King Saul would have went out and quickly dispatched of the midget and, and claimed the promises of God. But this wasn't a midget. According to who you listen to, this dude was between 9 and 12 feet tall. And it gets insignificant after that, whether he was 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, it doesn't really, he's just big. The head of his spear weighed 125 pounds. He threw this, the head of it weighed 125 pounds. You better have a big promise when you're going up against a dude that big. A little 17-year-old boy walked into that valley. He said, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you with a promise. I come to you in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. There's nothing more powerful than a promise from God. But we measure it. King Saul was hiding, but David believed. You're going to hide from your problems or you're going to be a believer. You just got to make up your mind which one you are. Are you a believer in the promises of God? Or are you going to run and hide and ignore until your problems consume you and your life is destroyed because you didn't lay hold of a promise and walk in it and live in it and believe it? And I know you've been worshiping. I know you've been singing. But somebody needs to hear that today. Promises quickly. If you're sick, you ready, Seth? We're going to go, go, go. If you're sick... Listen to what James said in chapter 5 and verse number 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the church. And they would anoint him in the name of Jesus. And the prayer of faith would heal the sick. Listen to Mark chapter 16, verse number 17 and verse number 18. And these shines will follow those who believe in my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Sister, you've got to take one more dose of chemo this week, and I'm so sad about that, but I believe this is a promise from God. You've got to take that deadly thing into your body, and I, in the name of Jesus, I don't believe it's going to hurt you. I believe it's going to heal you, and I need a witness in the house this morning. Come on, I need a witness in the house this morning. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark chapter 11, verse number 23. For assuredly I say to you, whosoever or whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Oh, my goodness. God, I need you to fix this for me. My finances are broken. My marriage is broken. My life is broken. My relationship with my children is broken. I need you to fix it. Believe in your heart that it shall be done. And I don't know how he's going to do it. I can't see around over 100. But I know that it will be done. Somebody lay hold of that promise and stand firm. And in the name of Jesus, let it start happening right now. Galatians chapter 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we lay hold don't get tired of the promise. Don't start, don't do like Abraham and lose your faith and send in the handmaiden. But hang on to the promise because his words are yea and amen and his promises are true and God cannot lie. And if you believe that, say amen. I'm going to talk to you about giving. I'll talk to you about being sick and believing God for miracles. Let's talk about giving. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31, one of my favorite scriptures. But those who wait on the Lord or serve the Lord, that word wait is like a, a waiter at a table. Those who serve the Lord, not standing around and waiting on God to move your filthy carcass into a different position, but no, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to wait upon him. I'm going to minister to him. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Luke chapter 6, verse number 38, give and it will be given to you, good measure. Pre- I know we don't have time to stop at amen a lot, but somebody's getting something. There's a promise in here for somebody. Give and it will be given to you, good. You've been wondering about paying your tithes. You've been wondering about helping a family in a tornado. You've been wondering about helping somebody go to church camp. Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Matthew 6, verse number 33 says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When you get a promise that you're going to live in, I want somebody to say amen. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 19. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me. God said, you try this. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Somebody say amen. You want to be a witness? Tim, this is for you in Bible study. Night on Monday, 126, Psalm 126. Verse number 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed. You want to talk to somebody? Why don't you get in a room somewhere and pray about it until you cry? you got a family member that really needs God. Why don't you go somewhere and pray about it till you cry? And you will sow that seed, and you will water it into that ground with your tears. He shall doubtless come again. And when you come back, you're not going to be crying. You're going to be rejoicing, and you're going to breathe your harvest. You're going to bring your sheaves with you. Somebody say amen this morning. And this is the greatest, most promised event. And you really got to believe this is going to happen because if you don't believe these next few scriptures and you can't lay hold of this, we've been talking a lot about heaven. We got to get our, we got to quit running our life by our sight and we got to start letting our insight rule the day. Moses had all these problems, but it, it wasn't the things that he saw with his physical eye, it was his insight, the things that raised his eyes to where he was looking at the Lord. Listen to these scriptures. The greatest promise, the most promised event in history is the second coming of our Lord. Can I get a witness? Acts chapter 1, who also said, men of Galilee, why do he had just left the first time? Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus this same Jesus. Everybody say this same. This I'm not looking for another Jesus. I'm looking for the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This same, the world's looking for another Jesus, but I'm looking for this same Jesus. Who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go away into heaven. How many believe that's really going to happen? First Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He will. How many believe he will do that? He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. How many of you believe that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read a couple of verses here. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. It will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave or O oh, hell, where is your victory? Somebody say amen. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is in the law. 
But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through this same Jesus. Amen. He shall come again. He will come again. And nothing will stop him. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. John chapter 7 verse 37 says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, you can believe in him, but you've got to believe in him like the Scripture said. There's a whole lot of people believing in him and based on some psychology written in the 3rd or the 4th century, but you've got to believe in him as the Scripture has said. As the Scripture, out of his heart or out of his belly, out of his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet. How come the Holy Spirit couldn't come while Jesus was still on the earth? I mean, come on, let's let's have a little Bible lesson in theology real quick, in the Godhead real quick. How come you couldn't have the Holy Spirit and Jesus operating at the same time? Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. And once he was glorified, he sent back his Spirit. To live in our heart. And the spirit that's living in your heart is the spirit of a risen Savior. Aren't you thankful for that today? John 6 and verse 35, and you can't believe it, but I'm almost done. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John chapter 14, 4 and verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Three more scriptures. The best, I believe the best ones, the best promises in the Bible right here. Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said to them, Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall. It will happen. You shall receive. Too many of us spend too much time seeking the Spirit or seeking the Holy Ghost. What we really need to do be doing is repenting because he said if we'd repent and we'd be baptized, that it's going to happen, and hell can't stop it from happening. Come on, let's give him a hand clap on that. That's a good one, isn't it? For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. Revelation chapter 21. This gives me goosebumps right here. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse number 4. And God will wipe away every tear, everybody say every tear, from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things. I'm laying a hold of this promise right now. The former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true. And faithful, these things are going to happen. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all the universe. Is all things include the universe? He who overcomes shall inherit the universe. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. And then the last scripture, Romans 8. For I am persuaded. Paul was about to lay down his life. He's thinking about it. He's writing a letter to the church at Rome. Thinking about his 
demise. And he said, you know, I thought about it. And I'm convinced of this one thing. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? I want you to bow your head. We've already had an altar call. I want you to bow your head with me for a moment. And no one looking around but me, just for a moment. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We live in the greatest nation, not just in the world today, but in my opinion, in the history of the world. The United States of America has offered more to its citizenry than any nation in history. I'm thankful for that. And because of that, sometimes I, the, the, the book of Revelation talks about the the spirit of the dark horse or has quieted the spirit of the Lord in the north country. And sometimes I believe that our, I believe that speaks of prosperity. And I think sometimes prosperity quietens the voice of God. And so we can live a long time without really absolutely having to have him. I mean, I know we got to have him to breathe and we got to have him for our body to function properly. But, I mean, assuming that all that's okay, we can go a long time. I mean, we got a good job. we got the bills paid. We drive a nice car. You know, we're not starving to death. The kids are making B's and C's, so we're okay with that. We're not, we're not, we can go a long time without just having to have him. Now, if you lived in Africa or you lived in some third world country and you had to wake up every morning wondering what you were going to eat, then your, your, your concept of God's going to be different. But we didn't wake up this morning. Uh, I could have brought an extra box of cereal if you needed it this morning. You just had to let me know. So we don't live like that, and that now is why I really need you to bow your head. But you've come to a point, somebody maybe, and you, 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 you can go to church five years, six years, ten years, and really not come to a point where you've got to have him. You just keep coming to church. That's okay. You just keep coming because there's going to come a time when that Sunday morning you've desperately got to have him. You've got to lay hold of something that's going to change your life. I don't know if there's one or if there's five or if there's ten, but I believe with all my heart there's somebody in here today that today has to be a different kind of day.